So, we are into uh, lecture 20, which is also included in module 8. So, uh, in this particular uh, section, we are going to discuss about uh, some uh, yield criteria or yield function uh, in which uh, anisotropy of sheets are actually considered. Okay. So, they are called as anisotropic yield function, anisotropic yield criteria you can say. So, but these yield functions will contain or yield criteria will contain uh, anisotropic characteristics of sheets. So, uh, this particular topic is a pretty large topic, a lot of you know uh, scientific uh, things one can uh, you know derive and uh, discuss, but uh, uh, considering the constraints of this particular uh, course and time limit. Okay, so, we are going to discuss only about a brief account of all this criteria. Uh, specifically, we will look into some important details about five important yield criteria. After that, uh, one has to look into uh, you know other textbooks or reference books which I already mentioned uh, for further yield. <coughs> so, uh, so, when we speak about anisotropy of sheets, uh, we all know that we are uh, particularly discussing about plastic anisotropy. Okay. So, we are going to discuss about how anisotropy affects the plastic deformation part. Okay. Elasticity is considered very simple. So, plastic anisotropy indicates the plastic properties are direction dependent. So, that is the first thing. We briefly discussed how to quantify all these things in the first chapter, okay. but then here we briefly discuss and then we go ahead. So, plastic anisotropy indicates that plastic properties are direction dependent okay. and this shows that what do you mean by that? It means that the stress strain curve, let us say, or the strain hardening behavior will vary with directions, will vary with direction. So, that means what? Suppose if you take a sheet, just randomly you pick up a square sheet and you cut a tensile sample along this direction, you do not know what is this direction, and you cut a rectangular sample along this direction. From this, you make a dog bone type of standard sample and then you do tensile testing, they may show different properties. They may show different stress strain behavior or uh, you know strain hardening behavior. Okay. So, the, which is what we are going to call as a, uh, plastic anisotropy. So, when we speak about sheets, when you speak about sheets, we know that uh, all are basically rolled sheets and uh, a sheet may be isotropic to start with, but it may become anisotropic due to subsequent plastic deformation. Specifically, in, in the case of sheets, it is going to be rolling of sheets. It is going to introduce uh, subsequent plastic deformation, which creates preferred orientation of grains preferred orientation of grains means grains oriented in a particular direction. So, then this rolling of sheet is basically going to control okay, uh, the, uh, the directions that we are discussing about, whether uh, it is along the rolling direction or perpendicular to that or it creates at any angle. Okay. For example, you get this along this direction could be a rolling direction. So, this sample is along rolling direction, whereas this sample is a transverse to rolling direction. Okay. So, with respect to rolled sheet, the uh, direction of rolling basically decides uh, the uh, anisotropic characteristics and uh, the origin is basically preferred orientation of uh, grains. So, how to measure uh, the preferred orientation of grains, all uh, such uh, uh, you know scientific things, one can refer other you know courses or other books, okay. but we will look into whatever is required. Uh, for us. So, this is the origin of plastic anisotropy and uh, you want to quantify it uh, with respect to some property or a parameter which we can estimate by experimental measures. So, in that way we can define this anisotropy in as uh, two uh, different uh, uh, you know quantities which we are going to define in the next slide. They are actually called as normal anisotropy and planar anisotropy. We have also discussed about it. Okay, uh, I hope you remember what is R, what is R bar and what is delta R, which we discussed in the first chapter when we uh, discussed about tensile properties. The same one we are going to briefly study here. So, what do you mean by normal anisotropy? In sheets, plastic properties may differ along thickness direction when compared to in plane properties. How do you quantify it? That is where the question comes. Okay. So, you take a, a sheet, okay. so you take a sheet like this and you will see that the in plane properties are different okay, when compared to its thickness. Let us say this is your thickness, these are all in plane 
directions this and this the plastic properties may differ along thickness direction so along this direction it may be different as compared to in plane directions okay in plane properties okay so you need to quantify it for example this is just for an example high flow stress in thickness direction suppose you can measure thickness direction flow stress okay how we will see later on briefly high flow stress in thickness direction when compared to in plane flow stress is good for deep drawing okay suppose you measure flow stress along the thickness direction and you measure uh, flow stress along the in the in plane direction okay and uh, high flow stress in thickness direction is preferable to have a good deep drawing okay uh, when we quantify this r value we will see that why briefly but it is good why because it shows good resistance to thinning and tearing it, it shows good resistance to thinning and tearing so you have you know a good strength in the thickness direction when compared to unplane means uh, in plane directions means in the thickness direction very difficult to deform the material it shows good resistance to thinning and tearing so you may have good deep drawability on the other hand there is another parameter called as planar anisotropy okay planar anisotropy means in the plane itself they may vary the properties may vary okay so in plane properties are different along different directions in a sheet in plane means in one plane other than thickness direction the other in, in the in one plane the properties are going to be different and we are also going to quantify one uh, pro good property which is going to uh, you know uh, in a way describe that and you will see that is going to actually control earring which is a defect in deep drawing what is earring earring is nothing but a wavy edge on a fully drawn cup suppose you have a, a cup which is fully drawn like this okay so you may have some waviness like this so let us say for example so this is actually called as earring this earring is actually controlled by this planar anisotropy so one should be careful uh, about uh, these properties okay so one is good one is actually not good for uh, sheet forming operation specifically when you speak about deep drawing so how are we going to quantify it so if you want to measure sheet anisotropy then we introduce a parameter or maybe a material property called as plastic strain ratio generally referred as capital r sometimes smaller also depending on the situation we use it is also called as langford coefficient it is typically used to represent the condition of anisotropy in sheets whose characteristics vary with the direction again in sheets it's going to be rolling direction for example suppose as i told you just now so you have a sheet here okay this is nothing but your rolled sheet so this is along rolling direction means so here in this direction you may have some properties as compared to this as compared to 45 degrees so this is what is called as direction dependent so orientation of sheets for measuring r i have written so in this way you can measure r in different directions with respect to rolling direction so anyway so what do you mean by plastic strain ratio r or langford coefficient as you know already r is nothing but true width strain by true thickness strain okay true width strain is defined as ln of w by w not divided by ln of t by t not using volume constancy equation we can write ln of w by w not remains as it is but the denominator can be written as ln of w not l not by w l because t by t not is nothing but w not l not by w l okay so true width strain divided by true thickness strain and uh, there are standards available for evaluating r value which we already discussed in the first uh, chapter itself okay so this is one good definition of r true width strain by true thickness strain so now along with that to quantify r for practical some practical reasons we are going to define two more uh, important properties which are actually functions of this r value okay so now what we are saying is if the measured r value deviates from unity okay suppose r is equal to true width strain divided by true thickness strain is equal to 1 let us say that means true width strain thickness strain are same which means we are going to call this as a isotropic material so until now we have seen all the discussion whatever done is only for isotropic sheets okay this is the first time we are introducing an isotropy so suppose if it is deviating from unity so not equal to 1 uh, this is not equal to 1 okay indicates that the in plane and true thickness properties or characteristics are going to be different suppose you say r is equal to 2 which means that true width strain would be equal to 2 times epsilon t okay 2 times 
epsilon t which means epsilon w would be double the time that of thickness strain which means that the material is stronger in thickness direction that is why you will be able to give lesser strain as compared to width direction strain that is why we are saying that if r value is larger means okay it is good for deep drawability why because in the thickness direction material is strong and uh, it will uh, you know resist or defend thinning uh, and tearing okay so now let us go back to our point here it indicates a difference in inplane and through thickness direction which is often represented by a parameter or property called as r bar okay and uh, it is a measure of normal anisotropy it is a measure of normal anisotropy so how do you consider uh, how do you uh, you know uh, define r bar if you consider three different rolling directions let us say r0 r45 r90 so r0 indicates means along the rolling direction 45 diagonal direction r90 transverse direction which you already mentioned in the previous slide right so r bar is nothing but r0 plus 2 r45 plus r90 by 4 this is the way you define it okay but it can also be defined and evaluated by numerical integration okay so r bar is going to be equal to integral 0 to pi by 2 r d theta divided by 0 to pi by 2 d theta okay suppose you can uh, uh, integrate it and find r bar maybe like by numerical integration using let us say trapezoidal rule you will be able to find out r bar okay you will be able to find out r bar so you have to discretize it basically depending on trapezoidal rule you can look into numerical integration part you will be able to get the same equation if you consider three different rolling direction so now you know r okay you know r bar so how do you get r you pick up a particular rolling direction and you follow standard method that we discussed already and then get r using usual definition epsilon wd by epsilon t you repeat that for 90 degree and 45 degree other than 0 degree then you get three values r0 r45 or r90 you put it in this formula you will get r bar these two are done now so how do you define planar anisotropy which is going to define how this anisotropy characteristic change in the plane itself in plane it is written as delta r you know, third parameter is delta r which is nothing but i have also we have already discussed about it it is going to tell you how different is r45 as compared to r0 and r90 so r0 plus r90 minus 2 r45 divided by 2 okay so r0 plus r90 by 2 minus r45 okay and uh, this may be positive or negative okay depending on that earring characteristics are going to change okay so your delta r could be positive or it could be negative depending on this your earring characteristics will change earring will be there but characteristics will change okay so one should look into it but although most of the steels they have generally positive delta r value okay so since r bar is going to control thinning resistance so we uh, we already said that uh, for a good deep drawability you need to have larger r bar and lower delta r lower delta r means earring behavior would be minimized earring behavior would be minimized fine so now this r is basically one quantity that we are going to use in this entire chapter r or small r capital r or small r we are going to use it in this whole chapter and uh, depending on the situation we are going to see maybe r0 r90 r45 uh, and uh, because you know r value changes uh, you know uh, with respect to rolling direction there are chances that your yield strength may also change during uh, with respect to rolling direction that is why we said that stress strain behavior would be different okay and the strain hardening will also be different with respect to rolling direction okay which means that we may see in several locations now depending on the situation depending on the criteria we are going to use r0 r45 r90 sigma 0 sigma 90 like that okay so then and there we will define it and then we will go ahead and uh, like in one minus uh, you know yield function we have derived a pretty long uh, you know discussion was made to some extent i mean we have made a long discussion you know what is one minus yield function why do you need it uh, sigma bar uh, equation and then epsilon bar equation all these things we discussed but uh, in this particular chapter we are not going to discuss all of them we are going to see mainly the uh, yield function criterion directly and then some important characteristics of that 
that is what we are going to do and then we go ahead. Okay, so, uh, and uh, whatever we discuss are very restricted only, there are several other yield functions available beyond what we are going to discuss, one should go ahead with further reading uh, by following other uh, you know textbooks or reference books. So, uh, when you speak about an anisotropic yield function or criteria, von Mises himself has given uh, one anisotropic yield function which uh, is written here. Okay, it is a pretty long one and it is of quadratic nature. Okay, this is the first yield function of anisotropic sheet that is what it is claimed and uh, which is a quadratic function. Okay. So, f is nothing but a function and you can see that uh, you have sigma 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 2, 3 and 3, 1 and uh, interactions between them and uh, interactions between them. So, you know what you mean by sigma 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, they are all normal and uh, shear stresses which forms a stress tensor and uh, all the h values h 1, 1, 2, 2, etc. they are actually called as h i j, they are nothing but coefficient of anisotropy. If you find these values, you plug in into this, then yield function is actually defined and these values will of course change from one material to another material. So, how to get all these properties that is a big uh, you know exercise, but the general you know framework of this yield function looks like this, function looks like this. So, uh, you can refer this, if somebody can get this particular reference long back, mechanics of plastic deformation of crystals. Okay. So, one probably one should be able to get into this particular equation. Okay. Usage of this equation is restricted. So, there are better uh, you know uh, functions, some of them we will see here. So, this is the first one. So, wherein your h i j is actually going to describe the anisotropic characteristics of the sheet and you have to evaluate it by lots of uh, mechanical tests. So, next to one which is uh, very important for us is the Hill 1948 yield function. This function is predominantly used, of course, there are some restrictions to use it, we will see at the end of this particular uh, yield function before we go ahead in the next yield function. So, this Hill's 1948 yield criterion okay, is also a quadratic function, it is given by this particular expression. Okay, you can look into it. So, there is a function which is nothing but f into sigma y minus sigma c the whole square plus g into sigma z minus sigma x the whole square plus h into sigma x minus sigma y the whole square plus 2l tau y z square plus 2m tau z x square plus 2n tau x y square is equal to 1. And uh, this is a, a generalized form of this Hill's 1948 yield function uh, in general coordinate system. That is why you have sigma x y z which are all normal quantities and uh, taus all taus are basically shear quantities. Okay. So, uh, just for a change uh, we have written here you know, x, y, z until now we were seeing sigma 1, 2, 3 only. Right. So, and then uh, just a small change here. So, I am using x, y and z. Later on we will change it at the end of this particular section we will change it. Okay. So, uh, now where is anisotropic? coming into picture here. This equation should have some uh, symbols which is going to quantify or some parameter which is going to quantify an isotopy of sheet and they are nothing but this f g h l m n, f g h l m n. These six values okay, f g h l m n are actually constants which is going to define your anisotropic state of the materials and you know that sigma i j as I told you are the stress components with respect to the orthogonal coordinate system. So, when you propose when we propose this particular yield function in this way, it is assumed that anisotropy has three mutually orthogonal planes of symmetry at every point. Okay. Three mutually orthogonal planes of symmetry, this is very important. Okay. This is where Hill 1940 yield function stand actually. So, the three planes of symmetry meet in three orthogonal directions which are actually nothing but principal axis of anisotropy. Okay. For instance, in a rolled sheet, the rolling direction is taken as one principal axis, I am denoted it by x for a reason. The other directions are in plane transverse direction y and thickness direction which is nothing but z. So, the previously we have shown a diagram R0, R45, R90, it is same only, but then three orthogonal 
you know, we are saying principal axis of anisotropy would, would be there. Three orthogonal directions which may be called as principal axis of anisotropy. One principal axis let us say x which is on the plane that is the rolling direction. The other perpendicular one is a transverse direction in plane 1 and uh, of course along the thickness direction that is let us say z. So, this x y z would be useful for us later on. Okay. So, now this is a function okay. and uh, what we are going to do now is we are going to see some small small derivations and we will see how to rewrite this yield function using known quantities that is what we are going to do. We are not going to do anything else how to rewrite this particular equation okay, in different forms. For that we are going to put some, some conditions, some derives on small small equations, some case studies, cases we are going to pick up and we see what is going to happen. Okay. So, now I am going to rewrite this in terms of x, y, z and r, s, t. Okay. What is x, y, z, what is r, s, t? Uh, it is available in this slide. Okay. We can discuss. So, what is x? I am going to consider this x direction yield strength as s. Okay. Suppose I consider x direction okay, yield strength, let us say for example rolling along rolling direction. So, that is x direction, just x, y, z is just for convenience only. So, that is that that yield strength is x. Okay. So, now I am going to okay, take x direction okay, and I am going to do tensile test, any axial tensile test, then uh, that yield strength sigma x should be x only and we know that sigma y and z are going to be equal to 0. You put this in the previous equation, you put it in this previous equation. Okay. So, uh, what do you say y and z is going to go away and only x will remain. So, this fellow will remain, this fellow will remain, it is going to be x. So, I am going to take x out. So, g plus h into x equal to 1. Okay. g plus h into sorry x square equal to 1. Right, yeah. So, x square will come equal to 1. So, our x square is equal to 1 by g plus h. So, the yield strength in x direction can be written as x square is equal to 1 by g plus h. Similarly, you can do same exercise with respect to y direction and z direction perpendicular to the sheet. Okay. Then you can get y square and z square. So, here y and z are y direction and z direction yield strengths you can call and y square is equal to 1 by h plus f and z square is equal to 1 by f plus g. So, this you have to exercise you have to do like this. Like this you have to do these two exercise it is for you to do. So, now x square, y square and z square are written in terms of f, g and h. Right. So, x, y, z are written in terms of f, g and h where f, g, h are nothing but in a way it is related to your plastic anisotropy, for example, R0, R40, R90 may come into picture in due course. You will see that. So, this x square, y square, z square can also be returned in this format, uh, wherein you on the left side you bring f g h, some simple mathematical calculation will lead to 2 f is equal to 1 by y square plus 1 by z square minus 1 by x square and 2 g will be equal to 1 by z square plus 1 by uh, x square minus 1 by y square and 2 h is equal to 1 by x square plus 1 by y square minus 1 by z square. Okay. So, you can rewrite this. Okay. So, now f g h in the previous equation Hill's 1948 yield function okay, is going to be a function of all the yield strengths. Okay. x is one yield strength, y is one yield strength, z is one yield strength. Okay. The only difficulty here is how to find z. Right. So, basically yield strength in z direction, how are you going to find out? That is the only concern here. Otherwise, f g h can be calculated. So, we know now what is x, y, z here. Similarly, you can also get r, s, t. r, s, t is basically, they are all basically shear yield stresses. They are actually shear yield stresses and from Hill's 1940 yield function, the previous one, you can put the same conditions, you know, similar conditions here. Okay. So, 2 L you can see. Okay. So, uh, would be 1 by r square okay, and 2m would be 1 by x square and 2n would be 1 by t square. Here, we are going to pick up this part okay, and we can get 2l is equal to 1 by r square and 2m is equal to 1 by s square and 2n is equal to 1 by t square. So, now the 
simplicity of this particular equation can be retained if you consider only principal coordinate system. Correct. That's what we were doing right from the beginning, even in 1 minus also. Okay. So, uh, when you go for principal coordinate system, this fellow goes off. Right? This fellow goes off. Only the first three terms will come into picture. This fellow goes off. Only first three terms will come into picture. We will see that now. Okay. So, before that, if you want to rewrite that equation in terms of plain stress situation, that is what we are generally looking for, is not it? When you form a thin sheet, maybe of the order of let us say 2, 2.5 sheet thickness, mm sheet thickness or less than that. Okay, if you want to look into that situation, which is what we are considering, then in that situation, you will see with respect to Hill's 1948 yield function, which you have just now written, we are going to put sigma z, tau z x, tau y z, all are going to become 0. Wherever z comes, they will become 0. Remaining terms, uh, sigmas will remain. Okay, remaining sigmas will be there. Sigma x, sigma y, sigma x y will remain. Okay, so then the previous yield function is going to become. Maybe you can look into it. It is g plus h sigma x square minus two h sigma x sigma y plus h plus f into sigma y square plus two n into tau x y square equal to one. Sigma z tau z x tau y z goes off right so this will go this will go this entire thing will remain y z will go off z x will also go off this fellow will remain so you will have uh, f uh, sigma y square okay so that will be here huh? you have to take uh, sigma y square common huh? so it will come out okay then uh, similarly you have uh, g minus g sigma x square that will have somewhere here. So, symbols, your signs will be taken care automatically. And then this has to be expanded. Uh, sigma x minus sigma y the whole square you can expand it and you can combine with the other two. Okay. And this since this is going to remain, so you will get uh, this particular equation. So, in general coordinate system, if you take plane stress, then this is the equation. The previous equation is general coordinate system considering all the quantities, non-plane stress type you can imagine. Okay, so, now you will see that uh, here it becomes easy for us g plus h comes into picture, your h comes into picture, h plus f comes into picture and n comes into picture which you already rewritten in terms of uh, uh, your uh, yield strengths, okay, your yield strength just before either x, y, z or r, s, t, okay, which is already written. Of course, there is only tau x, y here. So, what is g plus h? g plus uh, h is nothing but, g plus h is nothing but 1 by x square, correct. So, uh, I am going to put uh, 1 by x square here. So, 1 by x square into sigma x square minus 2h. So, what is 2h for me? Sorry, 2h is uh, this fellow 1 by x square plus y square minus z square. So, plus minus will come x, y, z. So, plus minus x, y, z to x square, y square, z square. So, minus is retained sigma x, sigma y plus what is h plus f is 1 by y square. h plus f is 1 by y square. That is also substituted here. So, 2n is nothing but 1 by t square which I already written this particular one and you can get this. So, this equation you will see it is in general coordinate system this fellow but in plane stress. Now, in place of our f g h, we have written in terms of some material properties. What are they? One is x or yield strength along x direction and y along y direction, z along thickness direction and then that is all. Only t is there. t is one of the shear yield strengths. t is one of the shear yield strengths. So, some known properties are inside that and uh, sigma x, y uh, and then uh, tau x, y have usual definitions. Now comes the further simplified part which is what we like. Okay. Suppose you want to write in terms of a principal coordinate system, then uh, this fellow will go off okay, from this equation. So, you can write 1 by x square is equal to, I am going to change now sigma x, sigma y, sigma z as sigma 1, 2. Okay. Sigma 1, 2, 3 anyway will not come here uh, because sigma z goes off. Okay. So, uh, I am going to write sigma x becomes sigma 1 and sigma y becomes sigma 2. 
Why? Because these two are sigma 1, sigma 2 are actually non-zero principal stresses. They are actually non-zero principal stresses. So how do you write? How do I write? 1 by x square into sigma 1 square minus 1 by x square plus 1 by s square minus 1 by c square sigma 1 sigma 2 plus 1 by y square sigma 2 square which will be equal to 1 and this fellow goes off. Okay, so this is a much simpler form I have here. The much simpler form I have here. So what I have done is basically a general Hill 1948 yield function. I have related FGH LM and to the corresponding yield strengths by applying these conditions and I, I rewrote it for plane stress first which is the first simplification then uh, retaining plane stress I have rewritten that in terms of uh, principal uh, stresses, principal coordinate system that is the latest one which we got here. Okay, So, this is simple to use this particular one simple to use why because there are only few quantities that you need to measure that is nothing but x, y and z. Right? Now, in this, in all these equations, there is no R value coming into picture, right? No R0, no R, R90, no where it is coming. So, what are we going to do? The next stage is we are going to relate plastic anisotropic coefficients and Hill coefficient. Plastic anisotropic coefficient means R0, R45, R90, depending on the situation, and we are going to relate that to FGH. And further, we are going to modify this equation in a very known format, which can be utilized easily by us. Okay. So, now for this, I am going to consider R0, R45 and R90 okay, as usual with the usual definitions, just change here, small r I am using does not matter, it has got a usual definition, nothing but plastic strain ratio. And I am going to use yield strength that is x becomes sigma 0, y becomes sigma 90, that is all. So, x, y, z we have seen before, which I am going to write in terms of sigma 0 and sigma 90. These are only changes now I have. So, what I am going to do now is I have to find strain increments. I have to find strain increments. And for that, you know, we are going to use a normality condition which we have defined in the second chapter. D epsilon ij is equal to d lambda into dou f by dou sigma ij where f is your yield function. And for Hill 1948 yield function, we have to use this particular f which I have given here. f into capital F into sigma 2 minus 3 the whole square plus g into 3 minus 1 the whole square plus h into 1 minus 2 the whole square to get strain increment. So, what do I need to do? I need to put f and then differentiate it with respect to sigma 1, 2 and 3 okay, to get d epsilon 1, d epsilon 2 and d epsilon 3 respectively. Okay, so, that one can do and find out and I uh, will just go through it. This we have done it for 1 minus yield function before. Okay, so, when we derive uh, epsilon bar for 1 minus yield function, Right, I know that uh, you know your uh, square root of 4 by 3 into 1 plus beta plus beta square into epsilon 1 we derived. So, for that, if you remember, okay, at the initial stage itself, we derived d epsilon 1, 2, and 3. So, similarly, we are also deriving it here, okay, using this particular equation, using this particular yield function of Hill 1948, one particular form, okay. So, 2 d lambda into g into sigma 1 minus 3, the 3 plus h into 1 minus 2 then 2 d lambda into f into 2 minus 3 minus h into 1 minus 2 and 2 d lambda into minus f into 2 minus 3 minus g into 1 minus 3. So, this yield function will be useful for uh, uh, this strain increments are going to be useful in due course as well. Now, what I am going to do is I am going to do some a small calculation here uh, to make things easy. So, now I let us see I am going to consider this rolling direction. Okay. This is a sheet actually the blue one is actually a sheet you can consider. Now, this is along one direction, this is along two directions. So, along one is let us say rolling direction which is nothing but 0 let us say, 0 degree, okay, 0 degree and the transverse direction we have already defined that is 90 degree rolling direction along 2, right, in this framework. So, now I am going to consider Rd along rolling direction. So, I know that along rolling direction I can write sigma 1 is nothing but sigma let us say and 2 and 3 are 0, right, 2 and 3 are 0. So, then what is R0? Plastic strain ratio in rolling direction R0 or capital R0 whatever you can write or Rd both are same which is nothing but. So, if you cut a sample in this way and find R value then this becomes width direction correct and thickness is in this direction perpendicular. So, 2. So, I am going to write d epsilon 2 divided by d epsilon 3 correct. 
So, d epsilon 2 is this, d epsilon 3 is this, uh, you divide d epsilon, uh, you get the ratio d epsilon 2, sorry, d epsilon 2 divided by d epsilon 3, this fellow, okay. And then maybe you can just uh, do some simple calculation, you will see that, uh, you have to put this condition, that is the main thing. Sigma 2, sigma 3 is going to become 0, no? So, if d epsilon 2 is what? 2 and 3 are 0, so this fellow goes off, 2 is 0. So, what do you get? 2 d lambda will anyway go off you are going to have h uh, divided by 3 is what? This fellow goes off, this also goes off, this two fellow goes off, 3 goes off, so you will have minus g, so it will be h by g. Okay, so, substitute these conditions into these equations and get it. So, now we have related one of the r values, let us say r0 to h and g, this is the way it turned out, h by g. Okay. Similarly, I am going to consider transverse direction. So, I am going to cut a rectangular sample and let us find R90. Okay. So, in this case, I am going to put sigma 2 will be there, 1 and 3 would be 0, 1 and 3 would be 0. Okay. Any axial situation, let us consider. Okay. And uh, now, if you want to get R value along 90 degree, let us say R90 or RTD, okay, then for this sample, this becomes width. So, that means I am going to write d epsilon 1 divided by d epsilon 3, which is nothing but this fellow divided by this fellow. So, you will get h by f. You will get h by f. So, it is very simple. So, r0 is nothing but h by g, r90 is going to be h by f. From this, from this entire relationship, I am going to write these 3. I am going to write these 3. f is nothing but r0, g is nothing but r90, h is nothing but r0, r90. How are we writing it? We are writing it in combination with these two. Suppose you take, substitute it here, R0 is equal to h by g. So, R0 is equal to, what is h? h is R0, R90 divided by g is R90, which is nothing but R0. So, find satisfied. So, h by f, so R90 is equal to h by f. So, R0, R90 divided by R0, which is nothing but R90, which is also satisfied. So, it is going to be simple for us now, f g h is becoming r 0, r 90 and r 0, r 90 respectively. Okay. So, now you know what I am going to do, we can directly write this equation in a simpler way, f can be replaced, g can be replaced and h can be replaced using this. So, this you have to get along with this. Okay. So, let us see what I am going to do here. Yeah. So, before that, uh, this is one important result that we need to see. We have already discussed that. Uh, x square is equal to 1 by g plus h, we derived in the previous to previous slide and y square is equal to 1 by hf, this also we derived. So, what is x square? x square is nothing but sigma naught square. Uh, in the previous slide only I told you that x is going to become sigma naught, y is going to become sigma 90. See, definition remains same, just a nomenclature is going to be different. This fellow is a sigma 90 square, correct. So, I am going to get a ratio of this sigma 0 by sigma 90. That means, uh, your sigma value, okay, your uh, yield strength along 0 degree rolling direction, yield strength along 90 degree rolling direction, you want to get a ratio, then it could be square root of 1 by g plus h divided by 1 by h plus f. What is g? What is h? We already derived. g is nothing but uh, r 90, we already given here. h is r 0 r 90, that is also written. h is uh, R0, R90 and then F is R0. So, everything is substituted here and you will get this simple equation. You want to get a ratio of sigma 0 divided by sigma 90 for Hills 1948 yield function, then you can relate it to R0, R90 by the simple equation. This is a very important result for us uh, with respect to Hill 1948 yield function. This ratio is very important. So, that means what? That means, if you know R0, R90 and sigma 90, you can find sigma naught. Okay. So, only three values are required to evaluate sigma naught or the other way. If you want to find sigma 90, you should get R0, R90 and sigma naught. That way it is going to work. So, now you will see that this equation implies that for R greater than R90, suppose you pick up a case where R0 is greater than R90, sigma 0 will also be greater than sigma 90 and vice versa. Okay. So, you can take an example and find out. Let us say R0 is, for example, let us say 2 
and R90 is let us say I don't know maybe maybe 1.5 you can say or you can take one also okay and uh, you you want you check you can check it here okay so your sigma 90 sigma 0 would be greater than sigma 90 okay so which means that if uh, r0 by r90 the ratio is uh, greater than 1 then sigma 0 by sigma 90 will also be greater than 1 that is another way but the problem is some materials however it has been observed that some materials do not follow this particular pattern we will come back to this this is very important result okay so uh, when you find uh, r along rolling plastic strain ratio along rolling direction greater than 90 degree then your sigma 0 will also be greater than sigma 90 but some materials is not going to follow this okay anyway so we will come to this later on so now uh, when the principal directions of stress coincide with principal anisotropic gases that means uh, in principal coordinate system okay we have derived this right just before we have derived this so now what i am going to do is i am going to rewrite this okay in terms of r0 and r9 i am going to replace all these things by r values so what is uh, 1 by x square so 1 by x square is for us is we already derived it now so 1 by x square uh, what is it 1 by x square is g plus h right so what is g plus h g plus h for me is r0 plus r0 r90 so r0 g plus h is r90 g plus h means yeah r90 plus r0 r90 so which i have written here this fellow 1 by x square y square minus z square what is it it is nothing but 2h which also we derived which is now becoming h is nothing but r0 r90 h is nothing but r0 r90 no right that also i have replaced here 1 by y square is nothing but actually h plus f which also i am going to write it as r0 r90 plus r0 equal to 1 okay so now this equation is becoming more relevant to us now in the von meyers yield function we are going to bring we have already brought r0 r90 into the equation and uh, now what i am going to do is i am going to just rewrite this okay uh, in this format so the coefficients are uh, basically divided okay let us say for example i am going to divide it by r0 r90 plus r90 then sigma 1 square will come and here 2 r0 divided by 1 plus r0 into sigma 1 sigma 2 and this flow will come which is equal to 1 divided by r90 plus r0 r90 so basically i am going to divide the entire equation by r0 r90 plus r90 to get the first part of this equation until this part which is easy for me right so 1 by r0 into 1 plus r0 what is it 1 by r90 plus r0 r90 1 by r90 plus r0 r90 r0 r90 mean g plus h no g plus uh, h 1 by g plus h is x square is not it 1 by g plus h is x square correct so now i am going to rewrite this as x square x square for me is sigma naught square and uh, using the previous equation sigma 0 by sigma 90 i can replace sigma 0 by sigma 90 into this equation okay which i am going to write it as r0 into 1 plus r90 divided by r90 into 1 plus r0 into sigma 90 square so this entire equation now has been modified to the next form okay uh, in which all the material properties are very relevant to us and you can see that uh, this is the hill 1914 yield gradient when principal direction of this coincide with the principal anisotropic axis okay which means that in principal coordinate system we are writing this so what are sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 uh, sorry sigma 1 sigma 2 they are principal stresses and r0 is nothing but plastic strain ratio in 0, 0 degree rolling direction r90 along 90 degree rolling direction what else you want to know nothing else of course sigma 0 is yield strength and sigma 90 is yield strength so what are the properties you need to know you need to know r0 of course you need to know r90 and one of this sigma 0 or sigma 90 because they are already related to each other okay it is very simple to use this particular criterion is very simple to use okay so r0 you can you know how to find r90 also you can find sigma 0 also you can find take a tensile test uh, do tensile test along 0 degree rolling direction and find out all the values right so now in the above equation you replace r0 and r90 by 1 
Hmm, R0 on R90 by 1, if you replace, what will happen? Sigma 1 square will come minus R0 is 1, R0 is 1, me, 2 by 2 by 2 will go off. Sigma 1, Sigma 2 plus what will happen to this fellow? Uh, 1, 1, so it is going to be Sigma 2 square, which is equal to what? Which is nothing but your Sigma 0 square, let us say. So this is what you get here, no? This is what you get here, right? This is the equation you get. So this becomes a square root of this fellow, right? So sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square minus sigma 1 sigma 2 equal to sigma f or sigma 0, okay? So you can convert this Hill's 1948 yield function in principle coordinate system, again plain stress, you can convert that into 1 minus equation which you derived long before by putting R0, R90 equal to 1. Okay, so basically, 1 minus yield function is a case of Hill 1948 yield function. Okay, so now we have seen almost 3, 4 different forms of uh, this equation. Okay, and uh, the one simplicity in this equation is R0, R90 and sigma naught can be uh, evaluated and you can use this for any modeling purpose. Okay, so now there are some cases in this. Let us say, for example, this particular sheet, any sheet you pick up, it is going to take only normal anisotropy. Only normal anisotropy means what? Your R0, R90 will be equal to R. Both are same basically. They will have some value, okay, but they are equal. But they are equal. Okay. So, if R0 will be equal to R90, then using this equation, okay, you can get sigma 0 is equal to sigma 90. You can try this. This is another important result we are saying here. If R0 is equal to R90 equal to R, okay. So, any R value you can put, okay, and you will find out that uh, sigma 0 would be equal to sigma 90. And what will happen to the previous equation? The previous equation is going to become very simple. I am going to replace R0 by R. So, sigma 1 square will be there minus 2R by 1 plus R into sigma 1, sigma 2. So, what will happen to this fellow? This is going to be R into 1 plus R divided by R into 1 plus R. So, entire thing goes off. So, it is going to be sigma 2 square, okay, which is nothing but my sigma naught square, which I am just writing it as sigma ys square. Both are same. So, this is another form of your Hill 1914 yield function when the material has normal anisotropy, which means R0 is equal to R90 equal to R. And if you use this equation, this also means sigma 0 is equal to sigma 90. Okay. So, now this equation can be used to, to check the effect of you know R and sigma Ys okay, on the locus. And what is the effect of R? You see that x and y axis are actually normalized values, sigma 1 by y and sigma 2 by y. And you will see that if by increasing R value diagonally, okay, the yield locus is going to elongate. That is one which is, I think we have seen this before also. In the next one, if you increase the yield strength, it simply means that basically uh, the yield locus is going to expand uniformly in the outward direction, expand uniformly in the outward direction. And the yield locus is defined by its form, which is nothing but Hill 1914 equation only, okay, which is nothing but your Hill 1914 equation only. So, the shape remains same and size increases. Uh, with increase in yield strength, let us say this is what is called as a, in a way isotropic hardening. We will see that later on. So, what is isotropic hardening means? The material is anisotropic, but hardening is isotropic. What do you mean by hardening is isotropic? It means that uh, the yield locus is going to expand uniformly with increase in your flow stress, but keeping the uh, shape same because shape is decided by form of the yield function, which is nothing but Hill 1940. So, I am just written here that the second figure that is this fellow, in this figure the yield locus expands uniformly with increase in yield strength. This is called isotropic hardening. So, we know that. So, now there are important things in uh, Hill 1948 yield function. What are they? Anomalous behavior. What is that? So, if we say that if R is equal to 1, less than 1 let us say, in general using the Hill 1948 yield function you will see that the yield locus predicted by Hill 1948 yield criterion is located inside 1 minus locus. Suppose R is equal to 1, if you say sigma 1, sigma 2 and if R is equal to 1, okay, then uh, if R is less than 1, 
your yield locus given by hill 1948 is inside this something like this okay and if r greater than 1 yield locus would be outside it goes out like this that is what is generally observed by hill 1948 yield function but later on woodthrope and pierce these two scientists what they noticed is some materials particularly aluminum alloys have yield locus outside 1 minus though r value is less than 1 suppose if you pick up r is less than 1 instead of locating inside the 1 minus yield locus it was outside 1 minus yield locus which is what uh, with this peculiar behavior was unable to be explained by hills 1948 yield function and that behavior is called as anomalous behavior it is generally called as anomalous behavior first order but there is some anomaly okay with respect to that material why because it is not following this particular requirement one of the requirement okay that uh, if r is less than 1 which is what is seen in many aluminum alloys okay uh, your yield locus is going to be outside the 1 minus equation okay this peculiar behavior was not explained by hill 1948 so we are going to call that as anomalous behavior of first order this can also be defined in this way okay in this equation which we derived before just now no for normal anisotropy if you put the equibaxial tension sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma b where sigma b is equibaxial yield stress okay you are pulling the material in two directions equally like alpha is equal to 1 this will give you alpha is equal to 1 let us say okay alpha is equal to 1 no? then there will be one yield strength no? that is sigma b if you put this condition in the previous equation you will get sigma b by sigma y s equal to square root of 1 plus r by 2 1 plus r by 2 so in this equation if you see if r is greater than 1 then sigma b would be greater than yield strength if r is less than 1 let us say 0 0.5 then let us say this 0.5 means 1.5 to 0.75 square root let us say then sigma b would be less than sigma y s okay but if sigma b is less than 1 this may not be satisfy satisfactory okay when we looked into this particular cases defined by uh, this anomalous behavior okay so this is uh, the first uh, anomaly that uh, they found out so now just a quick note of how do you find sigma b sigma b means what sigma b is means uh, it's a yield strength in equibaxial tension that means uh, this is your sheet you have to pull this sheet equally in the plane direction in plane direction and you have to monitor its deformation to get the yield strength so there are machines that can apply tensile loads in two directions at the same time and these machines are meant for balanced by axial tension test that means you have to maintain alpha is equal to one let us say so balanced by axial tension let us say sigma b at which yielding occurs is called yield strength in balanced by axial tensile test uh, tension test therefore sigma b can be estimated from these machines however it is not so easy it is difficult so you need to have a machine where you hold it and pull it uh, all the sensors have to be properly designed to monitor uh, the deformation load uh, load requirement all those things it is difficult so instead of that what uh, can be done it is generally like assume that the sheet is subjected to compressive stress let us say sigma c the thickness direction for example like this so you have the same sheet element let us say you are compressing it with the sigma c this will produce same effect as that of applying tension in two directions simultaneously as depicted below instead of pulling equally in this directions which you mentioned here what you do is you compress it in this direction uh, you provide c perpendicular to the slide instead of pulling it in the in-plane direction so when you compress it it will anyway expand which is what equibaxial tension is going to do so then uh, i don't we have to see how accurate it is but then therefore sigma b can be equated to sigma c but sigma c is in the thickness direction okay your sigma c you have to compress basically sheet the thickness direction that's all okay and we can say that this previous equation no? your sigma b by sigma y s we wrote equal to square root of 1 plus r by 2 this fellow can be replaced by sigma c this fellow can be replaced by sigma c here which is what i have written sigma c by sigma y is equal to square root of 1 plus r by 2 so many times you know if it is difficult for us to do sigma get sigma b sigma c can be obtained in this way okay so let us complete this part may what are the major demerits of hills 1940 hill criterion the first one is it cannot address anomalous behavior of first order which we have just now discussed which means for r less than 1 sigma b greater than sigma y s were observed just now we discussed 
There is one more thing which is called anomalous behavior second order. Also we discussed before. You remember this equation? This we derived now. This particular one. Sigma 0 by sigma 90 equal to square root of r0 into 1 plus r90 divided by r90 into 1 plus r0. No? Now I, we also said that if r0 is greater than r90 then sigma 0 is greater than sigma 90. But some materials do not agree with this. This is actually called as a, uh, another anomalous behavior. Okay, so, this equation no, which you already derived, what will happen if R0 by R90 is greater than 1, but some materials will show sigma 0 by sigma 90 less than 1. Okay, so, uh, that is one problem with Hill 1948. Moreover, uh, generally the criterion is applicable to sheet material which has got only 2 or 4 years during deep drawing. So, like we said deep drawing, no, cup deep drawing, earring is formed. So, only 2 or 4 years will be formed. Uh, not formed, uh, the deep drawing behavior can be predicted accurately using this yield function which has got 2 or 4 years during deformation. Okay, but practically you will speak there will be more years that can form, so which cannot be addressed by Hill 1948. And moreover it is also said that in e axial tension test the variation of yield strength with the direction is poorly predicted by this criterion though the variation of R value is described better. Suppose you do tensile test and get R0, R90 and you, you also get the sigma 0, sigma 90 and uh, it is said that the variation of yield strength with the direction is poorly obtained. But R0, R45 prediction is R value prediction is acceptable. So, these are the major demerits of this criterion. Specifically, the first two are very important, these two anomalous behavior. Now, before we go to next yield function, I thought this particular small derivation is going to be useful for us. How do you relate? stress ratio and strain ratio for an anisotropic sheet or sheet uh, in which we are going to include anisotropy while modeling. Okay. And of course, when you say that the relationship is going to change with alpha and beta depending on the yield function you choose and at least let us choose Hill's 1948 yield function and how do you get alpha as a function of beta or beta as a function of alpha is what we will see here. So, we know this, this particular equation is known to us. No? We derived the following relationship between alpha and beta considering sheet to be isotropy. Using levi meissner's equation, we already derived it. We can look into it. And using this only, we solved a lot of problems, correct? Alpha is equal to 2, 2 beta plus 1 divided by 2 plus beta and beta is equal to 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 2 minus alpha, right? So, we derived this equation before. So, now for Hill 1948 yield function, in principal coordinate system, we derived these three just now, d epsilon 1, 2 and 3. We are going to use it. How? What is beta here? Beta is nothing but strain ratio, epsilon 2 by epsilon 1, right? So, this divided by this, so 2 d lambda, 2 lambda will go off. So, f into 2 minus 3 minus h into 1 minus 2 divided by g into 1 minus 3 and 1 minus 2. Fair enough. Now, how are we going to write it here? For plane stress, this fellow goes, this fellow will go off, right? So, f into sigma 2 minus h into this g into sigma 1 plus h into this. Okay. So, now I am going to divide it by sigma 1 so that I get alpha. right? So, sigma 2 by sigma 1 alpha into f minus h into this becomes 1, this becomes alpha g into 1 plus h into 1 minus alpha. So, now we have derived it already. Now, only thing is we have to replace it with plastic strain ratios which we going to use it. Okay. f is nothing but r0, so replace it with r0. H is nothing but R0, R90, replace it. G is nothing but R90, replace it. This fellow is R0, R90. So, finally, you will get this simple equation. Beta is nothing but alpha R0 minus R0, R90 into 1 minus alpha divided by R90 plus R0, R90 into 1 minus alpha. Right? Very simple equation. Okay. Now, if you consider normal anisotropy, just before we discussed where R0 is equal to R90 equal to R. So, here if you in this equation, if you put R0 equal to R90 equal to R. So, it becomes a further simple case alpha into R alpha minus R square into 1 minus alpha divided by R plus R square into 1 minus alpha you will get and then you simplify it, you get a simple equation here. So, using Hill 1948 yield function, of course, plane stress has to be there because we have to bring in alpha and beta and uh, 
if it is not a case of normal anisotropy, then this is the simple equation you have, you can relate it and you put a case here R0, R90 will be equal to R, then you get this particular equation. In this equation, if you put R equal to 1, what will happen to beta? Because it is isotropic case now. R is equal to 1 means alpha minus 1 plus alpha, correct, divided by 1 plus 1 minus alpha. So, this is 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 2 minus alpha, which is what we got before, I think, is not it? 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 2 minus alpha, we got here. Right. So, now uh, depending on R value, you see, uh, you know, the relationship between beta and R are actually changing until now we were assuming that R is equal to 1, then it was simple. Now, all our, uh, you know, calculations, whatever we have done in the same problem is going to change by looking at one R value, okay. Suppose if you take R is equal to, let us say, any R value you can take, maybe like maybe, maybe 1.5, then uh, depending on alpha, the beta evaluation is going to be different, okay. So, now you can see for anisotropic sheets by considering this particular formula, what will be the alpha, beta, for uniaxial, plane strain, uh, pure shear, okay, and uh, you know other two cases, balanced by axial stretching, all these cases we can find out. Anyway, so now 1948 is over, now let us go to Hill 1979, we will not discuss much in all these things, we will quickly go ahead. So, Hill has uh, proposed another yield function, Hill 1979, which does not exhibit the anomalous behavior first order mentioned before, okay. The, the anomalous behavior first order which you mentioned before, no, that means uh, your, uh, though R is less than 1, your yield locus is going to be outside one masses yield locus, no, for like aluminum alloys. Then for, to avoid that particular problem, then he proposed another yield function which is given here, little bit complex, but uh, values are simple. F sigma 2 minus sigma m power m g, then 1 ma 3 minus 1 m h 1 2 m, then you have a b c comes into picture that will be equal to sigma naught power m. Okay, so, now one advantage here is only principal stresses are allowed here, where sigma i are principal stresses and f g h a b c are for example, anisotropic coefficients and sigma naught as usual is uniaxial yield stress. This is a modification Hill has done and here there is one fellow called M. This M is generally greater than 1. M has to be generally greater than 1 and what value actually depends on the crystal structure of the material. Let us say crystal structure you remember BCC, HCP, FCC uh, depending on that crystal structure this M value is going to change okay, and is generally greater than 1. Sometimes people do some optimization to get this value for a particular material. What are these characteristics? You can see in this criterion, it is assumed that principal direction of stress sensor coincide with the principal direction on isotropy, which means the principal coordinate system only we have written. Therefore, the criterion does not include shear stress terms, which is obvious from this equation. So, it is restricted to loading around principal axis, this is what I was telling you. Moreover, it is also observed, I have not included any data in this, but it is seen that the criterion does not always satisfy convexity condition, which is a requirement for any yield function. So, convexity condition, you know, we remember uh, that convexity and normality we discussed two important ones. So, your one, your yield locus have to be convex at every point in the yield locus, right. So, that condition is not satisfied by this con by this criterion sometimes, that is what is said. This is two, two important characteristics of this particular yield function. So, some cases we quickly discuss, of course, you can do this exercise. I am not going to explain you, this is very obvious and self-explanatory but this will lead to one important result. There are actually five special cases of Hill 1948 function under plane stress, under plane stress. So, which means that directly you can write sigma 3 is going to be equal to 0. So, if you substitute these conditions, okay, belonging to case 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 into this equation, you will get some other forms of equation, which is what is described here. So, case 1, if I take A equal to B equal to H equal to 0 and F equal to G, if you put in this condition, you will get this Similarly, you can take case 2, you can try it and check. Similarly, you can take case 3, similarly, you can take case 4 and similarly, you can take case 5. So, basically the, uh, you know, FGH and ABC, if you put some conditions to it, you will to lead to 5 different cases. And the important one, it is said that uh, this fifth case, 
a equal to b equal to f equal to g equal to 0 and f equal to g. If you put it in this equation, sigma 3 will anyway go off. This fellow goes off, no? Sigma 3 will anyway go off. a, b, f, g are 0. f, go, this fellow goes off, g goes off, a also fully goes, b also fully goes, okay, and f equal to g, f equal to g. Okay, so uh, then uh, you will get uh, this particular uh, equation. Okay, so uh, f equal to g means where is g for me here? Ah, g is here. Okay, g is here now. So this is going to become f. So f sigma 1 power m. Okay, then uh, sigma 2 power m then h into sigma 1 minus 2 power m and sigma equal, equal to sigma 0 power m. Okay, and this is what uh, is generally called as uh, Hausford yield function. So, uh, this Hausford, one form of Hausford yield function, this Hausford yield function is actually a case of uh, Hill 1979 yield function. Okay, this Hill 19 yield function has got this particular characteristics, it has got some restriction also which will lead to Hill 1990 yield function. This is just a general one I am describing, we are not going to discuss much. There is one more yield function called Hill 1990 which is little bit complex and you can understand that here. There is only one small difference here uh, that you have got T tau y. Tau y is nothing but yield stress in pure shear, sigma 1 equal to minus sigma 2. Let us see that also comes into picture and A and B are material constants, M has got usual definition like what we have discussed in the previous one. So we are not going to discuss much here, only thing we should know that this type of yield function exists. And sigma B is again available here, okay. Fine, let us go to next one. This, this condition, this criterion is very important for us. 1993, Hill's yield crater described before generally shows the condition sigma 0 is equal to sigma 90 enforcing r is equal to r 90, okay, which you can check it by this particular equation, correct, which we already done. This equation is actually uh, in connection with your anomalous behavior, second, second one, okay. This is what is being said actually. However, some materials such as aluminum alloy and brass sheets, they show almost equal yield stress, okay, they show almost equal yield stress, but then r values are very different but their R values along rolling and transverse direction, no? 0 degrees along rolling direction, 90 is along, they are very different, 90 degrees along different. So, some of the example you can see I have taken, suppose this brass 70, 30 sheet, sheet but this particular alloy you take it, so, sigma 0, 126, sigma 90 is 125, they are almost same, but you see R0, R90, they are very different, which is actually breaking this particular requirement, which is actually breaking this particular requirement provided by this particular equation. Similarly, this particular alloy if you take sigma 0, sigma 90 are almost same, but R0, R90 are relatively different. These two examples show that, okay, we need to be careful using uh, your Hill 1948 yield function for some materials like this, because this particular equation enforces these two conditions have to be there, which is not the case in such materials. This is referred as anomalous behavior second order. So now the question comes how Hill 1993 is providing, what is it providing? So in order to address the above concern, Hill 1993 Hill criterion was proposed which has a generality of Hill 1979, why because in Hill 1979 it is addressing anomalous behavior number 1 which is what is said. At the same time this Hill 1993 also should address anomalous behavior 2, okay. So, uh, with that, Hill 1993 was first proposed in the biaxial tension zone. Biaxial tension zone means the first quadrant of your yield locus. First quadrant of yield locus means this quadrant. Sigma 1, you can take sigma 2, no? This quadrant, first quadrant of you know, where the biaxial tension comes into picture. No? Then uh, this particular equation was proposed. Okay, you can just look into this equation. Okay, so. Uh, of course, you know that what is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 0, sigma 90, all are known to us except three things, one is C, then P and then Q. These three are bit different and what is C? 
c is also given here c is actually a function of sigma 0 sigma 90 which are nothing but the yield strength in 0 degree and 90 degree with respect to rolling directions it is defined now okay if you know sigma 0 sigma 90 you can get c c can be substituted here but you need to know p and q so this uh, this equation actually can be uh, satisfactory in two cases that is what is actually i have shown here suppose you take a uniaxial tension case okay suppose like you take uh, along a rolling direction you take one yield strength let us say sigma naught since it is uniaxial sigma 2 becomes 0 fine so you put this condition in this equation and check the left hand side would be equal to right hand side okay because sigma 2 becomes 0 no then this entire thing would be 0 this fellow also will become 0 sigma 2 0 mean this fellow also will become 0 so then what will happen is uh, sigma 1 equal to sigma naught so and these two will be equal because here it is 1 let it is satisfied similarly you can also get uh, so when you take a transverse direction so when you call that yield strength as sigma 90 and you put sigma 1 is equal to 0 here similarly left side and right side would be equal so thus the criterion is satisfied identically when the state of stress is uniaxial so when you pick up uniaxial type of deformation this equation is satisfactory you can also get if it is biaxial sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma b you put it in this equation okay you can find out that uh, it is going to give you this result which is what we have written it here also it is going to give you the same result okay so you put sigma 2 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma b in this equation uh, i think you do the small exercise okay so you will get this particular equation sigma 1 is replaced by b b b b square will come b square will come that's all so sigma b sigma b b square sigma b square will come so if you simplify this you should get this particular equation which also was shown before here for c this has been satisfied so it is suggested that the equation is same as the equation provided in the previous slide this indicates that the criterion is satisfied identically in the balanced biaxial or equibiaxial mode also okay so now what is p and q that is what we are going to discuss and then we stop here about this particular discussion so now as i told you before this yield function has five different fellows one is your sigma 0 sigma 90 sigma b and then p and q okay we said i said c p and q but c depends on sigma 0 sigma 90 and sigma b so i am writing sigma 0 sigma 90 sigma b p and q are there okay with respect to this equation right so uh, this p and q can be evaluated uh, so there is a big derivation available for this so i have not uh, deriving it here so i mentioned very clearly not derived refer some reference book so please refer some reference book so i have also indicated a reference book here look into it and then finally you will see that you will get the simple p and q equation which are actually functions of unknown already known values r0 and r90 so we are going to just see the end result here if this is the yield function okay and uh, one of that is c which is already known so then this yield function is easy to use why because all the properties are available with us sigma 0 can be obtained sigma 90 can be obtained sigma b also can be obtained now p and q have uh, you have to evaluate again p and q equations are also available for us in which only unknown things are actually r0 or 90 which also can be obtained okay so now finally we can say that in order to use yield 1990 the yield function only five properties are required sigma 0 sigma 90 sigma b which are already there now p and q instead of that you need to get r0 or 90 which are, are easily available how do you get you can do tensile test you can do r value test and you can do equibiaxial tension test equibiaxial tension test so you plug in all these things into this equation this equation can be used to model any deformation process so now this is the case only if you have in biaxial this is how it is derived now so now you want to expand or extrapolate this for other locations one two three these three uh, you know zones in the yield locus there is a small modification that is allowed here i have marked it in red color that small change is only there otherwise everything remains same so sigma 1 becomes mod sigma 1 sigma 2 becomes mod sigma 2 and you can extend it to get other quadrants 
The above yield function suitable for first quadrant can be extrapolated to other quadrants by using this generalized function. Okay. So, I think with this Hill 1993, it is said that it can address uh, the anomalous behavior number 1 and number 2. That is what is said and that is one of the merit of this part. both first order and second order anomalous behavior are addressed here. It depends on only phi material properties just now we have seen, right? Sigma 0, sigma 90, R0, R90 and sigma B which can be evaluated easily. What are the demerits? Useful only if directions of principal stresses coincide with orthotropic axis. That is why you have only sigma 1, sigma 2, okay, right? It is also said that it does not allow variation of anisotropic coefficient in New axial yield stress in the plane of the sheet. That is another demerit we say, but then we have to accept it and go ahead because it is satisfying the first two problems which faced by 1948, okay. So, before 1993, uh, 1979 also can be used, but it can address only the first one, anomalous behavior first one, that is what is said, okay. So, uh, but the second fellow addresses both. 1990 addresses both, fine. So, I am stopping here with respect to yield function discussion. So, there are a lot of other yield functions, okay. We have seen only Hill 1948, 79, 90 and 93. Hill 1948 has been described little elaborately, okay. And uh, other three cases are discussed minimally to what is actually required for us with respect to its characteristics and merits and demerits. So, this particular uh, a table, I took it from this particular book. Uh, so, uh, uh, we redrew this particular table and uh, this particular table tells you uh, different yield functions available plus what are all the data required if you want to use this yield function. For example, Hills 1948 you need as we discussed, you need sigma 0 then R0, R90. Sigma 0 or sigma 90, any one you need R0, R90. 79 also we have seen, sigma 0 then of course, sigma B was introduced then R0 is required. Sigma 90, there are a lot of things required. You can look into that equation. 93 also we said only 5, no? Sigma 0, Sigma 90, Sigma B, R0, R90 are there. There are several other yield functions you can you can look into it. Okay, various yield functions, Hills 1979, Barla, Barla himself has 2, 3 important yield functions. Okay, you can see that 1, 2, 3, 4 and KB is also there. Okay, there are four parameters in this, six parameters, six parameters. So, there are several such yield functions available which can predict the, the forming behavior accurately. Again, it is recommended, just a recommendation only, that Hill 1948 is a useful yield created to model forming of sheets and simple to implement because properties can be evaluated easily, but however, avoid using it for aluminum alloy forming. Okay, but for if it is aluminum alloy, then one can use. Uh, 1990 or Barla's yield function, anyone or KB's or others also, whatever is available, better suitable for modeling aluminum alloys. However, several material properties are required. So, you have to be a little bit careful which one to use to predict what. Suppose you want to see the tube forming of aluminum alloy, you want to model it, then use one of this, the bottom ones, 1990 Barla's or something, but then there could be several parameters, material parameters you have to characterize. Okay, but it is generally written that it is to avoid it. But if it is a steel tube and you want to study its bending behavior or sheet, it, you have to study its deep drawing behavior or any stamping behavior, Hill 1948 would be more than sufficient, okay, because the properties can be easily calculated. Okay, so this is what we can discuss about anisotropic yield function. So we have seen uh, four important yield function, predominantly Hill 1948 and Hill 1948 also, we rewrote that equation in few different forms. That is the main thing. Next one is important one is we uh, using Hill 1940 yield function, we derived relationship between alpha and beta, which was earlier for us uh, was a simple one without considering R value. This alpha beta had R value into that equation, which can be used for anisotropic sheets. That is the main thing. So, before we complete this, we let us briefly discuss about the difference between isotropic hardening and kinematic hardening. What is it? Isotropic hardening was just introduced to you just now. It is the case in which yield surface or yield locus remains of same shape but expands with the deformation or increase in stress. It is what is shown here for you. This is well known to you, sigma 1 versus sigma 2 yield locus. We always draw first yield locus, initial yield locus and then subsequent yield locus when you deform the material. So, I have 
drawn here a red color line you can see from here to here you can see it is elastic loading and after that it is plastic deformation or stain hardening and then you can unload the material. That is the way it is going to work and for uh, the yield function if you want to define which you already defined the function is a let us say f minus k equal to 0 in the simple way you can write which also tells the fact that the shape of yield locus is specified by initial yield function that f and size changes with respect to hardening parameter k. I hope you remember that we introduced this one when we discussed about uh, at the end of uh, one minus yield function where we are going to discuss about sigma bar. At that particular uh, you know slide or uh, you know uh, lecture you can see that we wrote a similar one and then I was discussing with you that one part of the equation on the right hand side is going to decide the form of the yield equation that that is going to tell you the shape of the yield locus. On the left hand side which is nothing but your I think 2 sigma bar square which is equal to k we wrote I think that k was going to decide the size. Fine, so now this equation is written. So now what we are going to do is this is also something new for us. Suppose if you want to write 1 minus yield function. So uh, how do you write? So 1 minus yield function at yield can be written in this fashion. So f is equal to this is known to you right 1 by square root of 2 into square root of 1 minus 2 the whole square 2 minus 3 the whole square and 3 minus 1 the whole square minus y minus y. y is nothing but let us say sigma 0 or sigma f like that we might have used to sigma f is not it. So now in this if you put 3 is equal to 0 it will lead to 1 minus equation we just now discussed. 4 5 slides back we used discussed that no? uh, when we study a case of Hills 1948 it resulted in 1 minus yield locus no? the same equation. This equation is well known to us which is also equal to we can write the same equation in two other forms one is using J2 the other one is using deviator stress ok square root of 3 J2 minus y y is a yield strength which is also equal to square root of 3 by 2 into Sij Sij minus y. This Sij Sij is nothing what is Sij? Sij is nothing but stress deviator tensor. This also we, we have seen in expanded form. When we derive 1 minus uh, you know, you know equation there is one particular stage where we derived that equation as a function of sigma ij dash right that is nothing but this Sij only. There we have used sigma 1 dash 2 dash 3 dash here we are just using Sij only where Sij is nothing but deviator stress but only difference is here we are writing in indical notation. This is index notation we are writing there we wrote expanded form. So how to expand it one has to understand from a different book we are not going to discuss here. Y is known to you what is J2? J2 is a second invariant of deviator stress. Invariants you know there are uh, invariants like I1, I2, I, I3 and J1, J2, J3 ok. So, I1, I2, I3 are generally related to stress tensor and J1, J2, J3 are related to deviatric tensor and uh, J2 is the second invariant of uh, deviatric stress that also can be written in this way. So, these are the different forms we use. These two forms are already known to us only this one is something new. I have written here this also you should know that. Sigma bar is nothing but square root of 3 into J2 which is nothing but 3 by 2 into Sij, Sij which is what you have written here. So now with respect to the previous equation what I am going to do is I am going to just substitute this uh, you know this function ok. This function is nothing but f is becoming now this is the function no. So I am going to use this square root of 3 into j2 minus y minus k equal to 0 ok. This is how 1 minus yield function can be written ok. So now isotropic hardening simply implies that if the yield strength in tension and compression are initially the same they remain equal even in further deformation with increase in plastic strain which means Boschinger effect is not considered here which means Boschinger effect is not considered here. So I think we have also studied this in bending nose spring back if you take sigma versus epsilon so you deform it like this and then you unload it and then you go this way ok you will see that uh, there is no change in yield strength because of softening in the compression side they remain equal they remain equal. So, which is what is uh, a general assumption we are making here. So, we are saying that uh, if the yield strength and tension compression are initially the same they remain same during the evolution also which means you cannot use uh, you cannot define or model Boschinger effect with respect to this which actually led to kinematic hardening. So, what is that to model Boschinger effect 
where hardening in tension will lead to softening in compression will lead to softening in compression which means that in the compression side your uh, yield strength will be less than what it was in the first cycle in the, in the tension side then if you want to include that then we can include we can do that by kinematic hardening and kinematic hardening if you want to describe with respect to yield locus it will look like this again blue one is the initial one and the red one is the current one because of kinematic hardening so this is a elastic part and this is a plastic deformation part and then unloading part is returned and you will he see here that the shape is same your uh, yield locus actually gets translated in the stress space the yield surface remains same shape and size but translate in stress space okay the shape and size remain same but it uh, gets translated it moves in the stress space which actually is a good one to model Bosch-Singer effect. So, how are we going to write it? We are going to write that yield function, any yield function you pick up, okay, with respect to kinematic hardening. If you want to write it, then you can write the function of sigma ij minus alpha ij equal to 0, where alpha ij is called as back stress or shift stress. Okay. So, what do you mean by alpha ij? Alpha ij means it is a back stress or shift stress, which can be defined schematically like this. Okay. So, let us say sigma 1, sigma 2 you are drawing. Let us say this is initial yield locus. Okay. So, the locus is shifted by alpha ij. Locus is shifted by alpha ij relative to the stress space as shown in this figure. So, you are going to shift the entire yield locus by alpha ij. Okay. That is what meaning of this particular equation. So, now what are we going to do is very simple. We are going to rewrite this particular equation in this format. Now, in this what I am going to do is I am going to use this, this equation is okay. So, I am going to use this known format for me. The uh, d matrix test, no? this particular form, square root of 3 by 2 into Sij, Sij minus y. No? Now, what I am going to do is, this Sij is a d matrix test, d weighted tensor. No? And what I am going to do here is, sigma ij minus alpha ij, right? You imagine that this alpha has got one d matrix part, which I am going to remove from Sij, okay, which is what I have written here. By considering one minus material, uh, again one minus is used, but kinematic hardening, okay, which is the simplest case. One minus isotropic hardening we have seen just before, okay. One minus kinematic hardening is what we are looking at here. Other yield function and then kinematic hardening is further complex. By considering one minus material and using d matrix part of sigma minus alpha. Okay, d matrix part of sigma minus alpha instead of d matrix part of sigma. Okay, so I am going to write that 3 by 2 square root of 3 by 2 into it was initially Sij Sij minus y. Now I am going to write sigma uh, 3 by 2 into Sij minus alpha Ijd into Sij minus alpha Ijd minus y equal to 0, where my this alpha d, you know, this alpha d is nothing but the d matrix part of alpha divatric part of uh, alpha. Since we are speaking about uh, divatric uh, stress, then pipeline no, or divatric plane will come into picture and what is it? It is what is given in this particular figure. In pipeline or divatric plane, we know what is it. Divatric plane means on the divatric plane, you know uh, how one minus is going to be, it is going to be a circle, right, which we discussed long back. On the divatric plane, your one minus is going to be a circle. In 3D, actually it is a surface. The cylinder, right? So, when you look on the divatric plane, it will look like a circle, okay? So, now with respect to that, what is this S minus alpha d is going to tell? That is what is discussed in this particular figure. So, in pipeline, the divatric part of alpha, there, there is divatric part of alpha which is alpha d, let us say, denotes shift of 1 minus circle as shown in this figure, okay? What happens? So, this is your 1 minus circle. Okay, this is your 1 minus circle, sigma 1 dash, 2 dash and 3 dash you see this is a 1 minus circle okay, on the divatric plane, uh, pipe plane we have given here. Now, this circle is shifted here, okay, let us say by alpha d times, alpha d shift is seen here with on the pipe plane, then S minus alpha d denotes this particular vector, if this is the S. Yes. What is S? S is nothing but Sij, which is a divatric part. Alpha D is nothing but 
the dewettering part of back stress and S minus alpha d is this which is what is actually put here to define your kinematic hardening von Mises material using von Mises yield function. So, it is very simple to tell 3 by 2 Sij Sij minus y equal to 0 which is uh, the conventional von Mises yield function is going to be modified as a root of 3 by 2 into Sij minus alpha d let us say into Sij minus alpha d hmm, minus y equal to 0. So, this part is the dewetric part of the back stress that is what is written here. Of course, one can write it uh, with respect to sigma ij also that is another way people write okay, that is also possible. There is only one small thing that we are going to do now what is that? We are going to see how this alpha is connected to your plastic strain increment or the direction of plastic strain increment. So, this linear kinematic hardening model it defines actually how yield surface is translated with respect to direction of strain increment. You can see that suppose this is a d alpha ok how is it actually connected to the direction of d epsilon p. Direction of d epsilon p is known it is actually perpendicular to the normal drawn at any point in the yield locus right. So, in linear kinematic hardening model we are introducing here the back stress assumed to depend on plastic strain following this particular equation. You can say that uh, your uh, alpha ij is equal to c into epsilon ijp that means it is linearly related using c where c is uh, actually a material parameter and it is constant when you speak about linear kinematic hardening model. Okay. So, what does that mean? It means that yield surface is translated in the same direction as that of plastic strain increment linear kinematic hardening model as shown in the schematic. If this is the direction perpendicular to it your d alpha or alpha is going to be in the same direction. But if g, if, if your c changes deformation then you need a non-linear kinematic model which is not discussed here you can go through it. Okay. So, now uh, if you want to replace alpha ij by c into epsilon ijp we can do that in the previous equation and you can modify the kinematic hardening model. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.